Hi, I'm Jen McIntyre. I've been homeschooling for about eight years and it is something that I absolutely love. But when I first started, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to teach. I didn't know how to approach the organization. I didn't know anything about how to make homeschooling a reality that actually led my kids to a point where they had an education. That was really, really overwhelming. So when I, I decided that I wanted to to make this jump, to change my life in this way and start homeschooling my kids. I did not know if it was going to be for one year or for forever. I just didn't know, but I knew that I needed some sort of outline and plan or I couldn't do it. There was just no way that I would accomplish anything if I was wandering around in the dark. So I started reading everything I could get my hands on when it came to homeschooling and home education. I studied everything I could find. I looked up homeschool groups in the area. I looked up books that I could read. And um, I spent a lot of time really, really thinking and praying and trying to decide what I was going to do for my family. And I came across this book, which is A Thomas Jefferson Education, and it's written by Oliver DeMille. And I remember I was at the pool watching my kids have swimming lessons, just cramming my head full of ideas, trying to figure out what I was going to do here in the next couple of months. And I started reading this book, and as I went through and read all of these uh, principles and this philosophy, I thought, this is really true. Like, it resonated in my soul. These things are true, and it also came with such a sense of empowerment that I can totally do this. This is something within my wheelhouse. I can take these steps. I can make this happen. And I have really followed this philosophy the whole time that we've educated. It has been really wonderful. And so I just want to talk to you today about what is it? What is Thomas Jefferson Education? And how do you do it? So a Thomas Jefferson education, it's also called a leadership education, has three main parts to it. And it's got these seven um, ways to mentor. And then it's got some different environments that you can mentor in, some different tools and methods that you can use to, uh, to teach. And then the third way, uh, or the third aspect of this is the phases of learning. And they're all really important, but once you understand these three parts of it, you really are good to go. And you can really do a lot inside leadership education and make it your own personal experience. So today, in this video, I'm going to talk about the seven keys of great learning and tell you this is, I mean, when people say leadership education, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about these seven things. And once you have them, you have a pretty good grasp on what leadership education actually is. So the first one, is classics, not textbooks. Now, every one of these seven things is written as a this, not that. And so they're um, really comparing the way that things are done standard in the public school system versus the leadership style and how this is a better, better method to teach the same stuff. So classics, not textbooks, does not mean never use a textbook. And this is really hard because <laughs> when they first did this, people use textbooks almost like a weapon to beat people over the head with. And so they were really strong in saying, don't use textbooks, this is not the way to go. But now that people don't use textbooks as much, as religiously, they're, you know, it's like, well, you can use them as long as you don't use them as your sole source of information. And your real main source of information should be classics. And here's why. Um, first off, classics are something that you learn new things from each time. So this is the basic definition of a classic. If you can go to it and get something new out of it every time you go, then it's a classic. And that leaves, there are a lot of things that can be classics. I find some books are classics for me that other people really don't like, they don't get a lot out of, and that's just fine. But it's something that I learn a lot from, or I learn something new from every single time that I, I pick it up or I engage with it. Classics are in every single subject. So you're going to have classics in art. Obviously, that will include things like great paintings and sculptures and um, music and all, pottery and all sorts of things that you can create. Those are classics. Books clearly are classics. Some people can be classics because they are very, very good at what they know. Um, Joan of Arc was visited by angels and they would be considered classics because <laughs> you can't get much more classic than an angel. And so these are things that you can learn from new stuff that you learn every single time. And it is, there's a lot of different things that qualify as classics. One of the things that I love about classics is that they keep things exciting. So when I first started thinking about homeschooling, 
one of the biggest problems I had with it was the idea that I am going to be sitting down at my kitchen table for the next 10 years teaching somebody the same thing over and over and over again. And they'll move on and they'll get to learn new things, but I've got another kid coming up and I'll have to teach them that same thing. And I just thought, I can't do it. That is, I will die of boredom. I cannot do it. And so when I came across this idea of using classics, as your main spine, your main textbook, that you can learn everything you need to learn from the classics, it was exciting. It was something that I thought, that's new. Every single time, are you telling me that I can read Jane Austen and teach my kids using Jane Austen? Yes, you can. You can absolutely use Jane Austen, Jane Eyre, um, Les Mis, all of these books, you can use them. They're fictional novels, but I am telling you, there is so much in these that you can teach your kids and the most important lessons they need in life. And then also things like good grammar and punctuation and you know, being able to convey your ideas in reasonable and logical ways. All of this comes from reading classics. And so that keeps it really exciting because again, you learn something new every time. So that keeps it moving. And that's way better than just sitting down and cramming through the same rules over and over again. So that was a real selling point for me when it comes to classics. The next key is mentors, not professors. Now the idea here is that a professor is somebody that stands up in front and pontificates and shares all of their vast stores of knowledge and um, a mentor is somebody who gets to know you on a personal level and helps you develop your own personal education and that is the first quality of them they're going to say hey i get you you are super excited in art so i'm going to help you use different classics that will teach about art to begin with and we're really going to dive deep into the different types of art and the different types of artists and we're really going to learn everything there is about art and then that will give you a foothold into other areas like math you use a lot of math in art now you can start learning about math but the mentor will instead of saying well you're seven years old it's time for you to learn this concept in math a mentor is going to look at it and say mm, you're this person, you need to kind of come at it from this angle because you're clearly interested in these things. We'll get to math when we get to math, but it's going to be very natural. It's going to be your personal experience. And so that is a really, really big part of being a mentor is recognizing everybody's an individual and they're all gonna get there eventually, but they're going to do it in their own way and that brings so much joy to the learning experience. The next thing is that you recognize that as a mentor, you're not the expert on everything. This I think is what the main problem we run into with lectures is that whoever's in charge of the class lectures on everything <laughs> from beginning to end. They're in charge of disseminating all of the information. I actually don't have a problem with people coming and lecturing if they're an expert in their field. If what you are sharing is something that you know about personally, you have experience with and you can share insights and applications and personal knowledge on it, great. I would love to hear a lecture. I do. I listen to podcasts all the time. I think that is a wonderful place to find knowledge because people are talking about what they're really, really good at. It's when you start saying, I have to be everything for everyone that we fall apart because nobody can be everything for everyone. So our mentor says, hey, I know I'm not everything. I know I don't know everything. I will find you someone who does. I will help you find a person or a skill or, a, um, or some sort of a resource that I can bring to you and you can then assimilate that into your education. So a mentor is really kind of a knowledge broker that they say, hey, we can go over here and get knowledge from these different places and they are the experts on this particular type of knowledge. And so you're constantly getting the very best for every single subject. That's the mentor's job, bring the best things together. And I love being a mentor for that reason. Um, knowing the phases of learning and teaching in age appropriate ways. Okay, so I'm gonna do a totally different video on ages of learn or phases of learning because it's a big part of leadership education. But you should just know that each phase you learn in different ways and so you must teach in different ways, not just different stuff. It's not that we're just covering addition at this age, it's that we're actually going to approach it in a completely different style because of how we learn at different ages. So a good mentor understands that different ages learn in different ways and you've got to adapt how you teach to that. Okay, third one inspire not required this is a real sticking point for most of us because it's really hard the um a lot of what we've talked about is kind of things that the kids do and so you can have them do it inspire not require is really on us there's a lot of effort that has to go into this it is uh you can't force it and we live in a world where a lot of people force a lot of things they just double down and get really firm and that's how you get your job done and that is not 
how strong leaders are made by making their own decisions and they you want them to choose it for themselves so you want to make it look good so the first way that you can inspire not require is that you really have a creator mentality so a creator mentality is really focused on the uh, the good and on solving whatever problem happens to be right in front of us and on finding uh, the joy in the moment as opposed to a victim mentality which is you know blaming other people and this is so hard and I got a bad grade on this and I don't know how to do this and woe is me you want to have a creator mentality that says this is straight up fun we are really going to enjoy what it is that we're learning about here and um, I think the two keys really to inspiring uh, are to you have to invite and you have to entice. So to invite somebody to anything, if you're at a party and you're gonna invite them, you have to be there. <laughs> you can't invite somebody to a party that you're not at. So you have to be where you want them to come. And then you have to make it look enticing. You've just gotta make it look good. So you've gotta be um, bringing a lot of excitement and a lot of um, caring about the education process to it. And that's what Inspire Not Require is, is just bringing your excitement. Um, so there are the three different phases I want to talk about really quick. There are more than three, but these are the, the phases that the kids are in your house learning. The tools that you can use in this phase are music, art, poetry, stories, and relationships. And those are just really great ways to inspire kids who are about zero to eight years old. From about eight to 12, that's your love of learning phase. And that your focus is of finding the fun and tons of new ideas. Let's learn about dinosaurs and the sun and how to work wood and how to bake and how to, um, I can't even, I mean, anything, everything. That's what love of learning is about is what is going on in the world. And let's just really expose you to all the things that are out there because this excitement, this basic awareness of things around them is going to really lead into what they want to do with their lives. And scholar phase, you teach truths and then you live them. So this is much more of the academic approach. At this point, they are actually sitting down. Um, your earlier ones, there's a lot more motion. There's a lot more going and doing. But in scholar phase, which is about 12 years old to 18 years old, this is where we really start hitting the books and hard. And you're just teaching truth. You're telling them how it is, what, I mean, not like, this is how it is, but more you're teaching them what the world is and the truths that run the world and then helping them get themselves in line with those truths so that they can really experience happiness in this life and also gain the skills they need to be doing what they need in their life, which is a huge part of leadership education is all about finding your own mission and figuring out what you should be doing with your life and getting the education you need to be able to accomplish that. All right, next one, structure time, not content. This has... Um, as its basis, the idea that you're going to have, kids will have agency inside their education. They're going to be able to choose, what do I want to learn? What do I want to be um, spending my time on? How do I want to learn it? Do I really want to be hands-on or would I like to observe someone else? Is it easiest for me to learn by watching a video or watching somebody else do it or reading a book about it or listening to a book? And so giving them lots of options will enable them to really make a choice and say, I like learning in this way and I can now pursue something because I'm really interested in it. Uh, you really don't, the main point of structuring time, not content is saying, we're not going to say I'm doing lesson one, then lesson two and lesson three. It's much more of a, we're going to do math. And then you do math for, you know, whatever time you structured for that for 30, 40 minutes, and then you're done. If you got three problems done during that time, then you got three problems done. If you got three lessons, awesome, you got three lessons. But you don't want it to be, you don't want it to eat their lives. And so you structure your time and say, that's as long as your brain can focus no matter how much you got done. So just structure the time and don't worry so much about making sure that you get a specific quantity of information in their brains. Uh, this actually helps because it gives you a sense of order and direction. You know, we are, we're moving toward learning about science. We're moving toward being exposed to history. Um, but it still gives them a chance to make choices inside of that so that they can say, well, I really want to learn about history by going to a historical place. And I really want to read this book about this person that we did go to a historical place. Now I'm really interested in them. And so letting them have that agency is really important. Like one of the most important things we can teach our kids. But you also want to know that in exercising their agency, they are moving in the direction of a good education. And so structuring time and not content really gives that assurance. Uh, this step does not work unless you're good at inspiring. If you just structure your time and you're like, now get to work, you must do spelling or whatever. 
it's not going to work. They're going to be pretty miserable. But if you, you focus on being good at inspiring, then structuring time and not content becomes really effective because now they're inspired and they want to learn, they want to do whatever it is that you're um, putting in front of them at this moment. And so you're able to have a lot more forward momentum. So you've got to work these two steps kind of together is work on inspiring and structuring just time. Okay, quality, not conformity. This is a major, major part of homeschooling is that most people do not give grades. And this is awesome because as I've discussed before, failure is fun. It's a part of the process in homeschooling. We make messes all the time and we make mistakes all the time. And this is important to understand that that is just part of the process. We're not going to stop and be like, in this moment, you have 80% success rate now we quit because that oh man that teaches all sorts of bad lessons so you just want to say hey we failed it's all good we're just going to keep going until we figure this out so this quality not conforming is all about really being okay with failing often all the time um, because the idea is that you learn to comprehension you don't say Here's your grade, you're done, move on. That's an A or that's a B, close enough, let's go. Everybody gets 100% all the time because you do not stop until everybody gets it. If you fail 300 times, then you fail 300 times. But you keep going and keep going and keep going until you really, really understand whatever this concept is. And you try it different ways and maybe you say, we're gonna shelve this for a while and we'll come back to it later because we're starting to deal with frustration. But we're not done until we've really gotten to the point where we have some quality comprehension at this point and not just good enough on the scale compared to other kids your age, you've got enough comprehension. Um, this is actually really helpful because it practices succeeding, which sounds funny because we're talking about failure, but what you're doing when you allow them to fail and fail and fail is that you say, we don't stop until we succeed. And so every single time you try anything, you end with a success. And that is really important for them to understand and for us to understand that life is all about failing. <laughs> That's a bummer, but I mean, we, we fail a lot until we succeed. And to not give up halfway through and say, well, I'm 90% there. You think, no, I'm going to go until I get it. And then you know that you're going to succeed. So the whole time you have them in your home and you're, you're teaching them, you are practicing success after success after success. And so they know when they get out on their own, they can succeed. They know that there's gonna be a lot of failures on the path, but they have practiced getting all the way to the bell at the top so many times that they feel absolutely confident that they can succeed at life. So that's a really important part of quality, not conformity. Okay, simplicity, not complexity. This is something that can be really, really tricky. Um, but leadership education breaks down the whole education into reading, writing, doing projects, and discussing. I know, it's a little bit hard because I think that's, what about science? What about math? But the thing is, you can learn science with reading, writing, projects, and discussions. You can learn math. In fact, you should learn all of those subjects, but these are the tools that get you there. Such a leap of faith to be able to say, we're going to do it this way. But if you think about it, science experiments, those are projects. Math experiments, those are projects. Um, reading about mathematicians, and I talked a lot about this in my thing on loops, uh, my video on loops, all the different things that have to do with math and science and history and spelling and literature, they really do all boil down to reading about it, writing about it, doing hands-on stuff with it, and then talking about it. That's it. That's education in a nutshell. And that can be, it feels too easy, but we, this, this next one, when we get so caught up on trying to try all the new things and, oh, I've just read this article on this and so clearly I need to change how I'm educating and I've got to make sure that I've incorporated this and it can be really, really overwhelming. If you distill it down and say, these rules work. If I do these four things, it works consistently. And so I will just keep trying to do these four things over and over in all of the different subjects. Sounds like it would be really boring, but the truth is 
There is a ton of variety inside of this. You change not only what you read, the subjects you read is going to, they're totally gonna to change from when you're six to when you're 18. You're gonna have a lot of different things that you're interested in. The depth of reading will change. The type of discussions, you know, when you start out, maybe you just discuss it with yourself or with the author by writing notes in the book or with your parents. And then later you get into discussion groups and maybe you start leading discussion groups. And so there's a lot of growth that can happen in every one of these. You start doing projects when you're little, it's just, blocks in the front room but then as you get bigger now you have a civil engineering project like there's so much growth and so much variety that can be a part of these four different um, types of learning these four different I don't even know what to call those tools of learning if you read write do projects and discuss it really does allow you to grow with it with your learning and your child's learning and really develop in a lot of different ways okay last one you not them this one's awful but it's also fun. <laughs> it's awful because it puts all the pressure on you because when you first start homeschooling, you're like, awesome, I'm going to get my kids in line. I'm going to teach them everything they know, they need to know. And um, when I read this, it said, no, you actually need to take all of that energy and all of that nervousness and anxiety and put it on you and say, I don't know anything. I need to really spend some time figuring out life and knowledge in general. And that was absolutely true. When I first started homeschooling, I thought, how did I graduate from public school? I don't know anything. And yet I graduated really well, but I just, I felt like I don't have any knowledge. And so that was really nerve wracking. But this enables you to take the time to say, let's put some knowledge in my head and some confidence in my soul. So basically what this means is pursue your own education, but this is not panicky. There are the three different, um, or I think I talk about four in this one, four different phases of learning. Again, this is a leadership education thing. Your core is from about zero to eight years old, and it has to do kind of the main learning focus of your core when you're an adult and you're trying to go back and pick up the lessons that you missed are your scriptures, your core book. Make sure that you are focused on the things that are truth in your life because when it comes right down to it, you need to know what is true in every single situation. That, I think that might be the most important thing that you can teach anybody ever, including yourself. So having that core down, start with reading your scriptures. Start your day with it, start your school year with it, start your week with it. Really have that be your center and your core. Okay, the next phase, like if you were working through these phases as a child from the beginning, this would be age eight to 12. If you're an adult and you've just barely heard about this, it's your age right now. So it's okay. When you get to this point, you're like, oh my gosh, I've never heard about this before. How can I possibly get it all done? You do, you zip right through them. You, you're able to do it much faster when you're an adult. So the next one is love of learning. You want to study things that you love and only things that you love. Do not get guilted into studying things you don't like because then you don't like them and it's miserable and you'll start feeling like, ew, I hate homeschooling and it's so much work and I have to study and I didn't like studying before and yuck. Don't do that. <laughs> get into things that you really like. There is something that you enjoy. There's something that you've always wanted to learn about or there's something you are already learning about. You just want to have more time for it. You need to spend time on things that you really care about because it is so important to your ability to inspire anybody around you. You have to have something inside of you that you care about, that you're excited about learning and you have it. There is something inside of you that you want to learn more about. As soon as you find that, spend time on that and stay there until you find something else you're excited about and then work on that. You will soon find that there are lots of different things that you're studying about and learning about and bringing experiences into your life and it's fun and you really love it. That's your love of learning phase. Just stay there until you start feeling antsy. At this point, when you start feeling like, I, I love all that I'm learning about, it's really great, but I feel like I need to do something a little bit more. Not that I feel like I should because I need to be a better mom or I need, you know, not guilt. Don't do this because you feel guilty. Wait until you get to the point where you feel kind of like a bubbling inside of you that's like, I can't stay where I am right now. I am feeling pushed and driven to do more, to learn more, to become more. When you feel that, you will naturally flow into your scholar studies. This will happen. This has happened with me and it went fast. I spent probably one year on love of learning and just absolutely loved everything I was learning. And then I just like burst into scholar phase because it was so much desire was so high to learn what I need, just everything. 
I didn't even feel like there's anything specific I needed to learn. I just wanted to learn everything. So it was very natural. There was no guilt involved. I didn't feel like I had to. I just really wanted to. And so wait, wait, wait until you hit that point, until you want to do it, and then naturally flow into learning a lot of things. The last um, two phases, really, uh, but I just wrote depth here. The, in depth, you find what you're really passionate about. And so all these things that you're studying, you've had exposure to all these different ideas in politics and in homemaking and in relationships and in finances and in um, raising kids and dealing with the things in the world around you, dealing with sports, dealing with addictions, dealing with um, screen time. You've learned all these different things and something is going to come to the top and percolate and say, hey, this, this one thing is really important to me. I really, really care about this one thing. At that point, you take that one thing and again, it's natural. You, you're not gonna do it before you really feel it. And when you get to that point, you're like, I am so excited about learning everything I possibly can about whatever has percolated to the top for you, then you really start deep diving into that subject and learning everything you can about it. Your education is going to deepen, your experience will grow, your passion will grow, you'll start having tons of confidence and feel like this, this is really something that I can do and that I'm excited about. Again, I spent probably a year on love of learning, maybe a year on scholar phase and a year on depth. And it just, they blended and I just went one to the next, go, 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 go. And I didn't even realize what was happening until I was done. <laughs> At which point I said, oh, I can see the pattern of what I went through, but it was very natural. Just kidding, I guess I did write down the next two. Okay, so mission and impact phase, that's when you use your knowledge to help other people. So you've spent all this time learning about all these different things and you say, hey, I'm really excited about this subject that I've learned a lot in depth about and I want to tell other people about it. This matters. I care about the environment. I really care about making engines that are more efficient. I am super concerned about the people in this bad situation or I'm feeling really connected to people that are in my situation or people are in a situation that I feel specifically qualified to help in some way. So you feel drawn to them and you use all of this knowledge to be able to really help the people in your life or the people that you could draw into your life. So the point of this is not to just have knowledge in your head because that's very egotistical. But the point is to say, God has a mission for me and I'm going to create as much of an environment inside of me with my knowledge and my experience so that I can do what he wants me to do. That is really the focus of um, leadership education. There you go, that's what I just said. Um, in addition to that, it is really fun and exciting and you have a growth mentality. In every single step, you go from, this is good, I can do this, I can handle this, to the, by, by the time you're done with that step, you are really excited to take on the next one. You think, this is something I didn't even know was possible. When I first met my husband, I had like a list of pros and cons. This is, or not, not pros and cons, but things that I'm looking for in my husband and things that he has and things that I'm not willing to put up with in a husband. And I had this list. And then I met my husband and, um, and I, I looked at what he brought to the table and he had so many things I hadn't even considered putting on the list. It didn't even occur to me that life could be as awesome as it was with him in my life. That is what leadership education is like, that you have this idea, well, education is making sure you can read and write and socially interact with people. But as you start into leadership education, you discover there is so much more to this. This is all about me becoming my best self, about helping people around me become their best selves. It is really, really exciting. And it's something that is a life mission and not just something that you accomplish when you're a kid. It's something that is an ongoing, exciting thing. So that's a very growth mentality. It always gets better. Um, the other thing that this provides, which is really comforting to me, is that principles are rules that just exist. They are just truths that have always been there. And as we line ourselves up with these truths, then we will get the benefits of the truth. Like the truth is, do this, get this. And these educational principles that we've been talking about today, they work because they're principles. If you allow kids to have choice in their education, they will have an increased ability to make choice in their life. Awesome. That's what you need. If you allow kids to find their own mission in life by giving them a great, great education and exposing them to all sorts of great things and classics and mentors and um, music and all these things, then they're going to have this wealth of knowledge to pull from to be able to move forward in their personal life mission. This leads to this, just like one end of the stick leads to the other end of the stick. You cannot separate them. They are connected. And that is really comforting because when you're educating, it's max 12 years and you really hope this works, but if you're using principles, it works. You're able to say, 
I know this will work, it has always worked, it is based on rules that always work. And so that brings a great deal of comfort with all the change and all the individuality that you bring into education. These rules, this framework that you have will give you confidence to know this will end up in a good education. I love leadership education because it is so empowering and it is something that really enables you to become your best self, not just your kids. I want my kids to be their absolute best selves and I'm doing everything I can to help them, but it's also about me. This isn't something that leaves me at the end of the day with as an empty nester and with nothing to show for it except sheer exha exhaustion, right? Okay, there's that too. But in the midst of my exhaustion, I have also become a better person. And that's what this gives. It's, you're not just disseminating information or checking off boxes. You're actually becoming a better person and inviting them along for that journey. I love that about leadership education. Um, check it out. I am not the arbiter of all knowledge about them. So check this out. They also have a website and they have a lot of different resources that you can uh, check out on their website and see what they have to offer. Thank you so much. And I will catch you on the next one. Oh, but hey, Subscribe, um, give me a thumbs up, comment, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks. Bye.